Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Faz Zuffer, and I'm the outgoing student body president at Roosevelt High School in Des Moines, Iowa. Alongside my co-moderator, senior student council member, Ellie Miglin, I'd like to welcome you all to the fourth session of our student council's Youth Voice Forums, a series that aims to connect youth with elected officials, political figures, and community leaders. Last Monday, all of you had the unique opportunity to connect with Senator Charles Grassley, the president pro tempore within the United States Senate. Then on Wednesday, we heard from former Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, alongside former First Lady of Iowa, Christy Vilsack. On Friday, we heard from Eric Branstad, a current advisor for the Trump Victory Committee and the Iowa director of Donald Trump's 2016 presidential campaign. Today, you'll have the ability to engage with Janice Rottenberg, who served as Iowa director for Elizabeth Warren's 2020 presidential campaign. As part of this Q&A, students will have the opportunity to ask questions about issues that matter to them from their own perspective. Today's Q&A will be the fourth of six that we have scheduled with bipartisan leaders and political visionaries. At our next event at 12 p.m. Central on Wednesday, please note the shift from our regular time, we will be joined by Huff Cooksey, who served as the campaign manager for Governor Kim Reynolds' 2018 gubernatorial campaign. And on Friday, our final speaker will be Misty Rebick, the former state director for Bernie Sanders' 2020 Iowa caucus campaign. She will be joined by Michael Fasulo, the Sanders campaign's Iowa field director. We hope to see you at each event and encourage all of you to continue submitting questions for our upcoming speakers. But now it's my privilege to pass the microphone to my senior student council co-host, Ellie Miglin, to introduce today's guest, Ms. Janice Rottenberg. Thank you, Fez. Before I introduce today's amazing speaker, I would like to quickly thank today's sponsors. CLE Productions based in Des Moines, Iowa, Sight for Smiles and Smarts, the College of Young Democrats of Iowa, and of course, the Roosevelt Student Council. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct privilege to welcome Ms. Janice Rottenberg as today's guest. A graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, Ms. Rottenberg formally entered the political realm right after she entered college, where she served as a field organizer for then Senator Barack Obama's 2008 presidential campaign. The neighborhood she oversaw in Ohio showed strong results for the Obama campaign in a state that would prove critical for his, his historic victory. Ms. Rottenberg's passion for politics then took her to Washington, D.C., where she served as an intern for the College Democrats of America and for the late Senator Arlene Specter of Pennsylvania. Once President Obama's re-election effort began, Ms. Rottenberg would work as an intern to the campaign's deputy finance, national fi field director while organizing get-out-the-vote efforts to drive home the president's second win. Soon after, in 2013, she would serve as a regional field director for Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe, uh, managing a team that would knock over 300,000 doors to keep the governor in office. All of these experiences would prove to be critical for Ms. Rottenberg as she would enter her most important position yet in 2014 as the coordinated campaign field director for the Iowa Democratic Party ahead of that year's midterm elections, turning out 50,000 Iowa Democrats who hadn't voted four years prior. During the 2016 presidential election, Ms. Rottenberg would serve Hillary Clinton's campaign in Iowa, Minnesota, and Washington, and took the helm of the organizing director within the Ohio Democratic Party for the remainder of that year. In 2018, midterm elections came to a heat. Ms. Rottenberg was appointed by the Iowa Democratic Party to serve as the coordinated campaign director of all races for Congress, the state legislator, and the governorship. Her efforts would lead to two congressional seats flipped blue for Democrats as the first two women to ever represent Iowa in the House of Representatives were elected. Almost immediately <laughs> after this result, Ms. Rottenberg was hired by Elizabeth Warren to serve as the director of her campaign in Iowa ahead of the 2020 caucus. The grassroots efforts coordinated by Ms. Rottenberg would lead to widespread support for Senator Warren, who earned the endorsement of the Des Moines Register and would ultimately place third in Iowa with nearly 35,000 votes or final votes. Ms. Rottenberg, all of us here at Roosevelt Student Council are immensely grateful for your time in providing insight, advice, and your perspective. We thank you so much for you being here today. Just unmuting. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Amazing. Um, well, first, I want to say thank you to Fez and Ellie for inviting me to join. I feel um, 
uh, very out of place uh, being welcomed alongside Secretary Vilsack, Christy Vilsack, uh, Senator Grassley. Uh, I'm a 30-year-old campaign staffer. That's what I do. Uh, but I'm really honored to be here and hopeful that I can in some small way be useful to you all and, and say some things that are interesting. And um, it's amazing that you all are uh, engaging with this stuff. And, um, you know, I, uh, like Ellie said, I got my start um, in 2008, I had just finished my freshman year of college and had never interacted with a campaign before. I grew up outside South Bend, Indiana, which didn't used to be funny and now is kind of funny. Um, but I just never really interacted with politics outside of like watching the West Wing as a kid um, and, uh, and, and being involved in 2008 as a summer intern really changed everything for me and, and made me uh, opened my eyes to a whole new world of ways that I could be involved in, you know, changing our government and changing the policies that we put forward and, um, and changing people's lives when they get involved with, with campaigns and advocacy organizations that um, help put their very smart ideas and, and real capabilities to work. So uh, I feel a little underdressed, but I'm wearing my, my two cents uh, ray gun shirt. So uh, if any of awesome. you uh, you know, remember the wealth tax change in the conversation. Um, I promise you, I will probably be uh, an unforgiving Elizabeth Warren fan on this call, uh, but hopefully I can uh, shed some light on some things and, and be helpful. So uh, with that, I'm happy to take whatever questions you all have. Well, you know, like Ellie said, we really appreciate your time today. And, you know, all of us are so impressed with the experience you've had. And as you said, you're only 30 years old, but in the past decade, you know, you've done what I think a lot of us would really dream of doing on several different um, historic campaigns, including that of Senator Elizabeth Warren. Uh, I think a lot of us, particularly students watching this, um, you know, as, as many of us have been in high school or even college, uh, watching this campaign unfold, um, I, I think we've, gotten, we've really gotten one perspective of it. And I think a lot of us are really curious to see uh, what the behind the scenes experience was like from your view, um, you know, from the moment when uh, Senator Warren and her, you know, initially small staff reached out to you uh, to serve as Iowa director, and then all the way until I believe it was February 2nd or 3rd when the Iowa caucus unfolded. Yeah. Um, well, one thing I'll say about campaigns is they have this nasty habit of kind of creeping up on you when you're inside them. So, um, you know, you, you, you start off and it's a couple of people in an empty office and you are trying to find some really cheap office chairs so you don't have to spend very much money. Uh, and it feels like you snap your fingers and suddenly hundreds of people are working and there are thousands of volunteers. So campaigns have this really funny habit of uh, sort of going by very fast and you wake up one day and you're like, wow, this got to be like a big campaign. Like this is a, this is kind of a serious, cool thing. Like last I remember it was just me and a couple other people. But um, I actually, my first conversation with the Warren campaign um, was in November, just after Thanksgiving. Uh, like you all said, I had finished uh, working for the coordinated campaign in Iowa. It was my third cycle in Iowa, and I was lucky um, to stay in touch with some of the folks at the Iowa Democratic Party and be invited to come back in 2018 and help elect Cindy Axney and Abby Finkenauer, re-elect Dave Loebsack, uh, elect Rob Sand, uh, run some other great races, take back some state house seats. But um, I, you know, I kind of knew that I wanted to come and do the caucuses. I'd done um, the 2015-2016 caucuses, I love Iowa um, and knew that it would be a great opportunity to come back. I got a call um, in November, right after Thanksgiving from Roger Lau, who uh, became uh, Senator Warren's campaign manager. And um, we had a great conversation for about an hour, mostly about the kind of team that he wanted to build and the kind of people that he wanted on it and, and sort of what the Senator was all about and what he thought made sort of her past campaign so special. Um, so we talked for about an hour and, and just kind of ended it on a, a nothing note. Um, you know, and I, I'll say this, uh, other women on the call might uh, recognize this feeling, but I was sort of like, well, you know, maybe I'll be a good second in command. Like, I'm not sure I'm ready to be state director. I come from organizing, it's very different. I just don't know that I can do it, but like maybe I'll find a friend who's gonna be a state director and go work for him. Um, and Roger actually approached me on our second or third call and said, 
uh, how would you, would you be interested in being state director if we offered you the position? And I was like, well, let me tell you all the reasons why, like, uh, you know, there are other people more qualified than me. And, you know, I don't have a ton of experience in communications. And, you know, there are other people with really great political relationships in the state. Like, I just do field organizing. It's, it's just, you could find somebody else. Um, and credit to Roger, he listened to that whole spiel and said to me, cool, so it's not a no. Yeah. Uh, and I said, no, it's not a no. I, we can talk about it if you, if you really want to. So um, I was really lucky to, um, to be in touch with an organization that um, took organizing really seriously, frankly, that um, uh, dismissed my protests uh, and, um, and pursued me for a role that I ended up really enjoying and, and really having a lot of fun with. And I think um, the fact that I came from organizing allowed us to put a lot of the facets of our volunteer organization and our field operation sort of front and center and, and made the campaign what it was in Iowa and sort of gave it a unique uh, flavor. So I was really lucky to work um, for a candidate in a campaign that um, sort of went out looking for me and, um, and really lifted me up. And there's this sort of weird thing in campaigns where like, organizing is uh organizing uh leadership don't always tend to kind of make it to the leadership of the campaign overall um that tends to be finance people or communications people or political people um i'm not even sure why and i think it's changing in a lot of ways there are a lot of great organizers now in leadership roles joe biden's campaign manager jenna Malley dillon is an organizer from the beginning um, Cory Booker's campaign was managed by a guy named Adisu Demesi, who uh, is also an organizer by trade. So it's changing in a lot of ways, but I was really honored to, to be able to grow into that role. And, um, and, and starting in January, I got to assemble my team and uh, go looking for all of them. And it took us a few months to kind of get an office space and a team together. But uh, from there, it all just kind of kind of rolled. Wonderful. So your first audience question today is going to come from Lily. Uh, she's unable to join by video, but I think her audio, uh, I think she'll be joining via, via audio if she's able to uh, connect right now. Uh, Lily, are you there? Hi. Um, thank you so much for speaking with us this afternoon. And my question was, what, aside from um, being a presidential race, what was it like um, being a part of this campaign in such a diverse and large um, fields this past cycle, um, aside from other races that maybe only had one or two competitors? A great question. Um, and I'd never, aside from, from the 2015, 2016 caucuses, I'd never done a primary race before. So I'd never worked uh, on any line other than kind of being the democratic campaign. And, um, you know, and I think it's funny when when you work on a general election campaign it's a very stark contrast between the campaign you're working for and and the other guy right it, you know most people sort of naturally understand the difference between democrat and republican um but this was such a diverse field um with candidates who were all across the the sort of progressive spectrum from you know very progressive to much more moderate um, the weirdest part was that, you know, I've, I've been working in campaigns for a long time. And so a lot of my good friends ended up working for other candidates and living in Iowa working for other candidates. Um, and it's, you know, it, it was funny because I think everybody was nervous about it in the beginning. Everybody kind of thought to themselves, like, are we all going to stay friends? Like, is the and I think when we set out, we kind of thought, like, there's no way this will get bitter enough that we won't be able to talk anymore. We'll figure it out. And I would say, like, I'm still in touch with all the people that I was before. I had friends who um, worked for pretty much every candidate um, because they either loved the candidate or there was the perfect job opportunity for them or somebody they really trust, a mentor of theirs went to work for a candidate. And so they went to, um, you know, I think, um, you know, I didn't go to work for Elizabeth Warren just because of sort of her policy positions or because of where she stands and certainly like, other candidates had amazing ideas that I also heard presented and thought like, that's a great idea. We should definitely do that. So, you know, I think it took some work to keep in that mindset. And I think sometimes for people who their first cycle was this cycle, their first campaign was this campaign. Um, 
those of us who are older and had friends on those other campaigns had to sort of be like, hey, don't let our love for our candidate get in the way of the fact that we're all on the same team and these are our friends, both like figuratively, we're all friends because we're all Democrats, but also like literally like I worked last cycle with this person <laughs> and they're fantastic and I hope we end up on the same team again because they're brilliant and, uh, and I hope we're all together. But there were definitely some moments, especially in Iowa, where other campaigns would do something fantastic and I would think to myself like, I know who did that. I'm annoyed that they don't work with me or on my team. Good on them. That was a brilliant idea. And like, God, I can't wait to be back together on a general election race. So um, uh, a ton of great examples of that that were both uh, infuriating in the moment and also like you had a little warm heart moment of like, my friends are so smart. So it was a, it was a lot of fun, but a very different experience than the ones I'd had in the past. Perfect. So that actually connects uh, really well with one of our, our next question uh, from Michael Mitchell. He's a rising senior at Waukee High School. Uh, sadly, he couldn't join us live today. So I'll just recite his question to you. What was the most encouraging moment on the campaign trail for you? Um, yeah. Oh, gosh, um, that's a great question. I'm thinking, uh, I'm thinking through. Um, here, this will be a little bit of a funny behind the scenes story. So um, we, a lot of, a lot of the like kind of big visibility events that happen on the Iowa Democrats calendar. So the LJ dinner, uh, Polk County steak fry, the state fair, wing ding, um, hall of fame. Uh, they're funny on a campaign because like in the perspective of winning voters, they don't mean a ton. Like you're not doing that much sort of campaign work. Um, but in a lot of ways, I think what happens at them and how you perform at them helps people either sort of feel confident and excited about your campaign or not so much. So there's a lot of pressure on you um, to do something big, creative, exciting, crazy, interesting. Um, they also cost a lot of money. Uh, they're fundraisers for local Democratic parties or for the Democratic Party in general as they should be. It's a very smart strategy if you have to raise money. Um, but you spend a lot of time when you're in my position thinking like, how much of our resources do I want to spend on something like this versus all the other things that we want to do that we need money to be able to do. So ahead of the Polk County steak fry, we spent a lot of time, we were hearing that other campaigns were buying just like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tickets. We were thinking to ourselves like, if we spend a ton of money on this, it's going to put us in a difficult position. We're not going to be able to pay for some other things that we wanted to do. Um, we were excited about some experiments we wanted to run. We were excited about financing some constituency programs. And we were like, we want to be able to do that. We like can't spend all our money on this. So we came up with a brilliant idea that we were going to like treat it like an organizing event. Uh, we were not going to do a ton of fanfare. We were not going to spend a ton of money on like a big visibility event. Um, instead, we were going to send everybody as a volunteer and have them use an app on their phone to record information and have a clipboard and talk to people. And like truly in the moment, I was like, this is either going to work or it's going to be a total disaster. 50-50. Who knows? Uh, and I was actually away. My best friend from college got married that weekend. And so I was at her wedding. The team was great. They did an awesome job. Um, but over the course of that wedding day, I was like reading the clips coming out of, uh, of the steak fry and reading these like Warren campaign brilliant idea to organize through the event, like so on brand. It's working so well. And that night, I think the Iowa poll had us in second or maybe leading that night. Um, it was a cool moment that I think uh, sort of weirdly validated some of my beliefs. I'm an organizer through and through. Like, I think you do the work first and people will follow it if you're doing the work well. Um, but it was a really cool moment that also was a little bit of a risk uh, that I was like sort of worried was gonna go bust. Um, and as like everybody else was too, but nobody said it. It was one of those fun things, like a group project where everybody's worried but nobody wants to say it to each other. So everybody's just quietly worrying to themselves, uh, except we were doing that with a, with a presidential campaign. So some things in life don't change and it includes like group projects stay scary. Definitely, and a uh, quick follow-up. What was uh, one of the more discouraging moments uh, during the campaign? Oh, that's also a great question. Um, 
discouraging moments. I'm trying, I'm trying to think through. Um, you know, I'll say, I think it took a while for us to really take off. Um, you know, we, we ended up having a really exciting summer of like, I've got a plan for that. And um, after plans became suddenly cool, uh, in an unexpected way, which I loved, but you know, I think the first six months or so were kind of tough. And like, we were convincing people to come work for our campaign on the promise that like we would try really hard and we would have a good time and we would try new things and we would like make the most of the campaign. When I took the job, um, I interviewed with uh, our communications director, our chief of staff and our campaign manager in sort of a group interview. And the only question I had for them is I asked, like I said, <laughs> jokingly at the time, I think I said like 19, 20 candidates will enter and 19 will lose, which I thought was a crazy number, but turns out it wasn't. Uh, like, what's the point? Assuming we're more likely statistically to be one of the 19 than the one, like why, why should we have done this? What was the point of it? And they had two really good answers. One is they said like, we wanna try new things. We wanna experiment. We want campaigns to be better for the fact that we played. Um, and two is they said like, she's going to advance an agenda that nobody else is going to. And she's going to talk about issues in a way that other candidates won't or don't. And it's going to force the agenda to be different. And, you know, even today, I think you see people talking about paid leave and universal childcare and a wealth tax. And certainly some of that is because other candidates also advance those issues, right? Like, it, I think we benefited from a diversity of voices and so many candidates who have sort of brilliant signature issues, but there was never a day that I wasn't proud that Elizabeth Warren was advancing the issues she was. So I think the discouraging part was like the first six months and then obviously like a campaign ending is pretty discouraging, uh, but I've also done enough of these to know that like you go on from a loss, no matter what happens, you kind of pick up an oar again and keep going. Sure. So our next audience question is going to come from Kiki. Uh, she joins us now. Hi, Ms. Rottenberg. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. Um, I actually had the pleasure of volunteering with the Warren campaign um, earlier this year in the fall, and I had a lot of respect for the Iowa campaign, so it's really fun to talk to you. Um, my question is, how did you deal with the many surges and at times losses during the many months of campaigning, and how did you do so while continuing to persevere towards the end goal um, in mind? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and first of all, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, appreciate it. Um, really, thank you to everybody who has volunteered for a progressive cause, a Democrat who has helped with a campaign, who has protested, uh, who has taken action. Like, it's all important and we've all got our lanes in the way that we like to get involved and um, it all matters. So, and thank you for helping uh, my gal, EW. Um, how do you deal with it? We have a fun saying, uh, don't ride the polar coaster. Um, it's really, really easy to get caught up in, you know, political commentators make like millions of dollars to go on TV and say thoughts out loud. Uh, and their only qualification is that they've like been near campaigns in the past. Um, some of them say very insightful things. Some of them just say words because they get paid to say words on the screen. Um, some of them say things that they think will be uh, divisive and frustrating and that people will engage with. So, you know, I think when you work on a campaign, in order to be invested in it, you kind of have to close off some of that. Um, and I think I've gotten better at it with time. Certainly, you know, when I uh, was an organizer in 2008, everything felt really personal. Every attack on Barack Obama felt really personal. It felt personal in 2012. Um, and over time, I think it's gotten easier to sort of say like, well, that's an unpleasant story or a thing I wish I didn't have to read or sort of a criticism of us. And to say like, is there anything in here that's worth me acting on? Is there anything in here that's like, correct and I should do something about that I'm in a position to change um or is this just more noise that you know we've got to keep sort of working our plan and keep going and the tough part I think about a campaign is to some extent you have to stay the course right you write a plan you say like this is what this election is going to take and I've got to go do this work and no matter what happens get it done and but to some extent you have to say like things are going to change over the course of the campaign 
the field will change, the issues will change, my candidate may change, um, how do I run a race based on that? Um, but I think a lot of it is just not riding the polar coaster, not letting anybody else do it either. When people would bring it up in the office, we'd like, campaigns are sort of a notoriously goofy place. So like we had a buzzer that we would buzz um, or various like noise makers that you would hit when somebody like started talking about the polls to be like, uh, -uh we're not doing this. Um, and I think it just helped build an environment of like, unless you plan, like the campaign's not gonna end just because there's a good or a bad poll result. So all we can do is keep going. And I did get really good at like forgetting when Iowa polls were coming out. I don't know how I ended up doing this, but like the last two or three, I forgot about in the lead up to them and remembered like 20 minutes before it came out and then spiraled out for about 20 minutes in the office, like laid on the floor in the fetal position, rolled around on the floor, like panicked, had to be fed a few times. Uh, and then the poll came out and it was like, you can't change it, right? The poll's the poll. It's been in the field for like a week. So you're going to get what you're going to get. And at the end of the day, you will still keep going. So uh, forgetting that the poll was coming out was really, was key emotionally for me. Thank you. So, you know, just a quick follow-up question uh, to what Kiki and Michael had asked uh, just now. Um, you know, I, I think, and this essentially ties in with what you, you were saying about political commentators and, you know, kind of uh, enduring through the highs and lows of campaigns. It seemed like, um, uh, you know, heading into the fall and then in, into the winter, um, Senator Warren and Senator Sanders had like an interesting kind of relationship where I think they were seen as the two progressives uh, within the array of candidates. And I think they, um, were largely refraining from really attacking one another. And then it seemed like that kind of came to a head in January when I think it, during the CNN debate that was hosted here in Des Moines, um, it, you know, there was a bit of an incident between the two candidates. Um, and, and that seemed to be, you know, capturing a lot of the headlines. You know, what was the behind the scenes process like, or what was really going on behind the scenes um, as all of this was unfolding? Uh, you know, it's a, it's a great question to which I don't really know the answer, which is just to say like, you know, my job was to stay laser focused on Iowa, was to stay focused on who are the voters we're talking to, when are we talking to them, what money are we spending to talk to them, how are we training our volunteers for caucus night to organize their groups at the precinct level, like, are we being efficient with our resources or not? Um, campaigns are a brilliant patchwork of people who have their set of responsibilities and just like go hard in the paint at those. And you really have to trust each other in that process. So like certainly over the course of the campaign, there were moments where a story would come out, we'd put out a statement, we'd say something that I'd be like, really? But I also had to trust that our communication staff was really good at their jobs, that if they were putting out a statement that it was going somewhere, that sometimes they were just gonna do something that was like, a mistake as I do too, right? We're all people working in a fast paced environment. We're all gonna do things that we look back and go like, I should have done something different there. Um, but in general, it was my job to trust our national campaign apparatus to come through on some of those pieces. And look, like, I think it was funny in a historically big and diverse field that you know, Senator Sanders and Senator Warren were sort of like put in this progressive lane. One is if to say like none of the other candidates were progressive, which I don't think is true. true. Um, but two, like it fostered, I think, a sense of competition between the two of them that like doesn't have to be there, right? Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't have to be a like we get a progressive and we get a moderate and that's it. And, you know, what's funny is when I was going through the process of interviewing for campaign jobs, uh, before I, I took the job with Senator Warren, I went through sort of like a panic phase where I was like, do I want to work for Elizabeth Warren? Do I want to work for somebody else? I feel like I've barely explored my options. And I ended up talking to somebody who um, was managing the national campaign of a candidate who was considered a moderate, um, who I'm not going to name because that's rude. Um, and he spent an hour being like, there's gonna be a moderate lane and there's gonna be a progressive lane and there's gonna be maybe a third lane, but like we're gonna come out of the moderate lane and be the winner of that moderate lane. And this election is gonna come down to a moderate versus a progressive in like a big battle. And I, at the end of the hour was like genuinely convinced and went to my best friend and was like, maybe I should go work for them. Like he has a point. And she was like, that's, that's ridiculous. Like you wanna work for Elizabeth Warren, please stop this. 
Um, but it didn't end up going like that, right? And it was a great theory. Like day one, going into it in November of 2019, like, sure, that's a great theory to have for how this race is going to go. But um, you know, I don't think it turned out quite like that. I think it turned out a lot more complicated. Um, and so I think it, it was frustrating at times sort of uh, having the two of them treated as though they were one lane and agreed on everything sure. when I think they agree on a lot of ends, um, but they don't, I think they tend to differ more on how to get from where we are today to what they both see as like the desired outcome for a policy. Great. So our next question comes from a rising freshman at the University of Iowa, Chloe. She joins us live. Hi, Chloe. Hello. So like Kiki, I did some door-to-door -door volunteering for Elizabeth Warren, and I have a lot of admiration for all of Warren's Iowa campaign workers who I've been able to meet. So you are not an Iowa native. However, you have lived here for a few election cycles. Specifically during the start of your career in Iowa, what did you do in order to educate yourself on the needs, frustrations, and hopes of Iowans? It's a great question. Um, yeah, that's right. I, um, I'm from Northern Indiana. I came to Iowa in March of 2014 to work as the uh, field director for the coordinated campaign that year. Um, you know, I think I was, first of all, I was lucky to kind of be surrounded by a lot of the Iowa Democratic Party infrastructure. So there are a lot of folks there who are either native Iowans or came to Iowa 10 years ago, 15 years ago, who both one, know their way around the state. They know the people, they know the places, they know a lot of the past political issues that have come up. Um, and if you're willing to listen and you come and say like, hey, I wanna learn, can you teach me some things? Uh, they will give you all of the time in the world to help you become sort of literate in, in the issues of the state. But you know, I think there's also this like, I will say this, I did more political work this past cycle than I'd ever done in the past, which is to say like, I spent more time going through lists of elected officials, thinking about who should meet Senator Warren, um, thinking about who together might be a great endorser pairing to put out because you know they really represent different parts of the state and different things that make the state special. Um, I learned a lot about like old feuds uh, in the last year that I like had no idea existed um, because I only date back to 2014 and like some people had been mad at each other since like the 80s and you have to learn about that. So just like any state or any place or like like a family, there are things that you find out later that you're like, wait, these people are still fighting about this thing for this reason? Like, how did I not know? Because well, like, unless it comes up, nobody tells you. Um, so I got to spend a lot of time with people who really know their stuff and um, got a chance to meet some people who um, have really been helpful to me over the years. And I think, I think there is something special about joining um, coming to the state for the first time and then being able to come back again just with the state party in that like I got a chance to meet and be friends with people who ended up being on different sides of both the 2016 and the 2020 primary um, but we had a good relationship and were able to talk and go through things and I was able to get feedback from them even if they'd endorse some other candidate um, because they wanted to see the party be better in the end and they wanted to see any candidate contribute to the party. They wanted to see, you know, our organizers enjoy their experience and come back. Um, and I think that's also something really special about Iowa is that um, folks in the state really love that so many people from out of state come in every two or four years and get to know the state. Um, and I've been the beneficiary of so many people who are like, you should come back again. We'll make it fun and we'll help you learn your way around and we'll help you feel like you're not so lost. Um, so that you want to come back again and do another cycle. Because if you are smart and caring and hardworking and you uh, give a crap about the people around you, um, Iowans will try to find a way to bring you back again, which uh, happened to me three times. So uh, it, it, it works. It, they drag you back in a good way. So it's been a lot of fun. 
Yeah, I have a quick follow up to that. Um, obviously, organizing is like a pillar of your strategy and everything, as well as the Warren campaign was especially good with using uh, like apps to help connect people more one-on-one um, -on -one when they're out in the field and everything. So how has your strategy changed during your time working in Iowa, um, both like for this campaign as well as with Obama's? Yeah, I mean, to give you like some wild perspective, when I was a field organizer in 2008, um, I didn't own a smartphone. So I had my own personal flip phone and then the campaign gave you a flip phone as a work phone. Um, we, I had like a GPS unit I borrowed from my parents to be able to like drive around, but most of the organizers didn't. And so we would map quest our directions and print them out and staple them before we left the office. <laughs> um, and like, that's how we would get around and one week we decided that we didn't want to be dependent on MapQuest anymore so we refused to use it for a week and we were just late to everything for a week and our our rod was not happy with us uh for that bit that we got into but campaigns have just changed a ton right even in the last two years you know 2016 was the first cycle that we used peer-to-peer -peer texting which is the apparatus by which like you, if you get like push notifications via SMS on your phone, you get those like you text a code to a number and you get push notifications that we call SMS. There's a whole separate type of texting called peer to peer, which we can text any phone number we want to because we have someone pressing a button. And some of you may have volunteered doing this for advocacy organizations for a campaign for the Sea Party. Um, but peer to peer was brand new to 2016. We'd never used it before then. It wasn't a consideration. Back in 2014, we had making phone calls, knocking on doors, making phone calls and knocking on doors. And so, you know, one thing is it, that's been great is I think we've been able to open up volunteering to a lot more people who before either it was just scary and they weren't ready to commit to something like that. It was physically or like it was the difficult for them to physically do, right? People who um, are disabled or, or have limited mobility um, who can't leave the house easily. So I think it's allowed us to expand how we involve people, but it's also made talking to voters more complicated, right? Fewer people pick up their phone, fewer people answer their door. Um, our organize, the organizers will tell you like those doorbells that have a video in them, they hate uh, <laughs> because people do not answer the door for them. And they're like, please, I just want to talk to you. I'm friendly. Um, but we've got so many more ways to talk to voters now. It means we've got to be more thoughtful about who we talk to and where. It means we have to think more about when we go to knock your door, have we already texted you? Have we already tried to have a conversation with you, the voter, by some other platform or method? So um, it's given us more options, but it also makes it more complicated. Um, and it means we've got to teach organizers more, right? Like, it's funny because, you know, it, I, now we call it digital organizing if you're organizing online. Like in 2008, I was a digital organizer. I just like Facebook, I posted on people's Facebook walls because that was what you did back then. Like there wasn't Facebook messaging. You didn't text your volunteers. Like they didn't text. You posted on their wall and that's how you talk to them. So my like memories from 2008 are filled with when it comes up in my like time hop stuff it pops up with like a bunch of posts that I put on my high school volunteers walls because that was how we talked to each other. And that was like what cool kids did. Um, so things have changed, but at the same time, like organizing is still about finding people who are interested in what you're interested in, finding ways to get them talking to via some platform, their neighbors, their friends, people they know, having productive conversations in ways that we know work about why they should vote for a candidate, about how to vote. And this year, I think that's especially important because so many people, I think, are rightfully kind of scared at the idea of going to a polling place and that might be how they normally go vote. So many states, I has been doing vote by mail for a very long time, but so many states are doing vote by mail for the first time this cycle or for the second time this cycle. And there's so much opportunity to talk to people about a new way to vote that might feel a lot safer and more comfortable for them this year than going to a polling place. But fundamentally organizing is always about getting people who are like-minded, who, who care about the issues to talk to other people um, the methods of talking have changed uh, and the way that we go find those people have changed, but it's always kind of the same theory um, 
and it'll change again, right? Five years from now, I'm sure there will be some new platform that I've never thought of before where people talk to each other all the time. Like Snapchat was a thing and now TikTok's a thing. Like I remember talking about how we could use like Foursquare on a campaign. Foursquare died like three or four years ago. So um, the platforms are always changing, but the idea is the same. And as long as you kind of uh, stay tuned in and ask questions of people, um, you'll, you'll keep up. Wonderful. So your next question was submitted by Tom Brandstad Phillips. And uh, his question was, what's one misconception uh, a lot of people might have about democratic campaigns, um, even at the state level? Hmm. That's a good question. Misconception about democratic campaigns. Um, you know, I'll say I think a misconception that people have about campaigns is that like, everybody's very involved in the message and that like the message is the most important part. I think that even people who work on campaigns sometimes have that misconception and think that like having a clear message is the thing that matters most. You know, I, I took a class in college on polarization in partisan politics. I took it the semester after, after I came back from working on the Obama campaign, which by the way, like if you do take a semester off of school, um, get somebody to convince you that college matters again after you go back or you'll be like me and you'll spend like a year convincing yourself that this doesn't matter, trying to convince your boss to give you a job even though you're 19. Uh, that didn't go well. She made me finish school, which I appreciate. But, um, you know, it, in an age where party means so much to people and people sort of fill in so many blanks based on the party that you're affiliated with, I think it can be really tough to drive a unique message. Um, and I think if you do it, it has to be really clear, right? People, like the goal of a message is that you're trying to get people when they hear your candidate's name to say, oh, that's the candidate who does X. A great example is Elizabeth Warren has plans. Like it didn't, couldn't be more complicated than that. People were not going to necessarily grab onto like, she has these types of plans and she does these things. And like, let me explain more about her. Um, but I also think that a campaign matters a lot more for the way that it talks to voters and sort of how it pushes out that message than necessarily the message itself. So I think a lot of people think like every part of a campaign is about crafting a message. Really, I think like that message has to be true to the candidate. It has to be something that the candidate believes, gets in their bones is about, is gonna say no matter what, if they get asked a random question by a heckler, they're gonna stay on that message, not because a pollster told them to and not because the campaign devised it as a brilliant message, but because like it's who they're, it's like what they're about and it's who they are. Um, and I think that's where good message comes from is the candidate has a core belief that they hang on to and bring into everything that they do. And I think a campaign is much more about how you put that candidate in front of audiences to say that thing. And how you go recruit other people who believe in that message too to speak on behalf of the candidate, whether it's volunteers or staff or surrogates traveling a state uh, or the country. So I think uh, I learned that by working for Elizabeth Warren. I didn't realize how much um, how much is about sort of what the candidate believes and who they are and, and what they stay true to. And I think um, we had we got to see a number of candidates in 2020 who like very clearly had something that drove them and that they were passionate about. And like, you could kind of see that in the authenticity of them and their campaigns um, and what they were about and successful or not. I think it's always cool to see that in action. Perfect. So our next question comes from Mac Dempsey. They recently graduated from Roosevelt High School. If elected, how do you believe that Vice President Joe Biden will represent progressives like Senator Warren and her supporters in his presidency? Um, you know, I think it's been really cool to see how the Biden campaign has taken on and learned from some of the things that got people excited during the primary. Um, and look, I think like it's really difficult to govern, like being the person, there's a big difference between like a campaign and being the person in charge. And I've never worked on the official side. I've never worked for a candidate in office. Um, and in part that's because like, I enjoy kind of like the rough and tumble, push the boundaries, like just get it done, it'll be okay kind of attitude of campaigns. Um, working in government requires something really different. It requires that you be really thoughtful about what precedent is like, about what institutions are set up to do, about how you can change things. Um, and I think things look different in government. And, and 
what's funny is I think like for everybody who says like Elizabeth Warren, big plans, like changing everything. If you read through some of her plans, she's really thoughtful about like the way we make this big structural change is that like we tweak this organization's rules to do the following things. And we'll use this operation within this cabinet department to do the following things. So it's like very thoughtful about what you tweak. Um, I think that Joe Biden has more experience than anybody else when it comes to how the government works, both how you get a legislative body to pass something that uh, that they can agree on. He's been part of really divided Congresses in the past. Um, he's also somebody who's been in the executive branch and knows what it takes to to put a team like that together. And so, you know, I think a lot of of what he's able to get done will come from the people that he brings into his administration and the ways that they run with the department that they are part of or don't. Um, and I have a lot of faith, you know, he talks a lot about like bringing in the next generation, empowering the next generation of people. Um, and, you know, I'm an Obama original. Uh, that was my first campaign. And so uh, I love Uncle Joe uh, as part of that. Um, you know, I worked for the Obama Biden campaign twice uh, and loved every minute of it and, um, and have a lot of confidence that he's the kind of candidate, but also just the kind of man who wants to see the next generation succeed and, and will take the steps that he needs to as president to, um, to put people in charge who are going to do something with the job and, and make good happen, um, whether they're, you know, in, in some small government staff position or, you know, whether he's talking about a secretary of a department that has a lot of opportunity to, to make a lot of good. So, uh, you know, before we get to our, our last question, I was just going to mention, you know, it's been in the headlines last few days that uh, Senator Warren is being considered uh, to potentially serve as his vice president um, uh, should he win the presidency. So, you know, that'll be something really interesting to see in the weeks and months moving forward to see if that comes to fruition. But, uh, you know, our last question for you today is twofold. Uh, you know, first, we're wondering what's next for you. Um, you know, are there any other campaigns you're planning on working on, or can we even expect to see you running for something in the future? Um, and then the second part of that is, you know, to anyone who's listening right now, and we're recording this and planning on posting it later, um, to people who may be listening in the future, you know, what advice do you have for any young people uh, who may be interested in, you know, becoming a part of the whole political process? Yeah. Um, what's next for me? Uh, I love working in this field. It's been an honor to work on all the campaigns that I have and especially to work with the people that I've gotten to work with um, has just been an incredible experience. And there are so many people who uh, I've gotten to be so close with and consider like family members because we've spent so many late nights uh, and early mornings together in campaign offices. So I'm hopeful that I'll find a way uh, to finish this cycle um, working to help elect a president and other Democrats across the country, still figuring out exactly what that looks like. But uh, we still got 140 something days, 41, 42, something like that. Uh, and I want to make sure that I'm using them to uh, to get rid of Donald Trump, to elect Joe Biden and elect uh, so many great Democrats. Both we've got some uh, tough incumbent protections that we've got to pull off, but also cool opportunities to, um, uh, to take back the Iowa State House, to elect Rita Hart, uh, some really great stuff, especially in Iowa. Um, the advice that I'd give everybody um, is a couple of things. One, um, the best piece of advice, the best rule that my first boss had was she used to say, no task is too low. She used it in an example of we had a bathroom in the campaign office and it had to get cleaned. And so she'd take turns cleaning it and we'd all take turns cleaning it. But a lot of things on a campaign are really not glamorous at all. Uh, things have to get folded and stapled. The bathroom has to be cleaned. Uh, there are late nights and uncomfortable phone calls and a lot of like tough tasks that go into building a campaign operation. Um, I'd encourage you all to remember that no task is too small or too low and have that kind of attitude going into work when you are just starting out, but also continue to have that attitude uh, as you advance in politics or really in anything. I think um, I've been able to build really great teams and have really smart people working around me um, by keeping that at heart and remembering that I'm not bigger than anybody or more important than anybody. I'm part of a big operation that takes all of us to make it go around. And just because I have 
a bigger, fancier title now than I used to before. Um, doesn't mean that I'm any more essential to the operation than the field organizer, the volunteer, uh, the press secretary, the data deputy, anybody on the team who makes our operation go around every day. Um, and two, remember to help others up the ladder. I think um, one of the things I've enjoyed most about campaigns is that it's a really uh, close community of people and we try to help each other and we try to look out for each other um, and find opportunities for each other. So if you have the chance to be involved in a campaign, bring others in with you. Um, if you have the opportunity to take on a role and you can bring uh, new people into the process, like make it a warm, welcoming, inviting space. Um, I've been so lucky to learn so much about myself and grow so much working on campaigns. Um, both when I was 18 and even now. Um, so help others up the ladder, keep the attitude that uh, no task is too small for you. Everybody's got to work together to get things done. I can build a banker's box in less than 10 seconds because I've built so many on campaigns. Uh, I actually enjoy it, but like people think it's a cool parlor trick now. Um, but like I'm still building banker's boxes and I got to be in charge this last cycle, but the banker's box has got to be built and we all work together to get it done. And so um, it's really a, a great community experience to be a part of if you get a chance to. Um, and I hope you all find ways to be engaged in the process again, whether it's working on a campaign, whether it is uh, working for an advocacy organization, whether it is protesting, whether it is organizing in some other way. Um, there are so many valuable ways to make your voice heard and um, just remember to bring others with you and help make it an accessible space uh, for everybody because everybody's got that in them if you let them have it out. Well, Ms. Rottenberg, you know, all of us at Roosevelt Student Council, all of us watching uh, are just so immensely grateful for your time today. Um, you know, from the very moment we reached out, you know, you were so receptive and so interested in participating. Um, and that's something that we really appreciate, especially, you know, coming from someone of your political stature. And I think to everybody watching right now, um, you know, you're living proof that one doesn't need to be in their 40s or 50s to have made such a difference within the political spectrum. Um, so all of us are just so honored by your time. Uh, and to everybody else who's watching as well, um, I'd like to encourage you to continue participating in our forums for the rest of the week. Um, as a reminder, on Wednesday, uh, we will be hearing from Huff Cooksey, who served as campaign manager to Governor Kim Reynolds in 2018. And on Friday, we will be hearing from Misty Rebick, who served as state director to Senator Bernie Sanders uh, in these past caucuses. So uh, once again, Ms. Rottenberg, we're immensely grateful and we wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Thanks everybody for joining.